Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 26th of July. A pretty quick update this week, as we can see. Just a few updates to look at. New videos this week. I just did one video and I really dived into leveraging the large language model, specifically the OpenAI GPT model in Azure AI using REST. Instead of using a software development kit for a specific language, how I can just talk to the REST endpoint, which is just a URL talking over HTTPS, which means I can leverage it with anything. Pretty much everything can speak REST. And so I demonstrated it with PowerShell, and we create a little chat interface just as a PowerShell command it with history. And so it has some memory and context of what we're doing. Now, the reason I only did one video is I was gonna do a second one about the, uh, I guess the elephant in the room, which was the CrowdStrike incident. But honestly, I didn't wanna jump on that ban and we're gonna clickbait things or go into the detail. But a number of people have kind of asked and so I guess just super quickly, in case there's still some confusion, but there's been so much said about it now, I don't know if it really needs saying. But if I think about an operating system, one of the key different parts of the operating system is there's really a user space where most applications you run are executed and they have limited access to things. And then there is the kernel. And the kernel really has unrestricted access to the hardware. So what very often happens in the kernel is we have device drivers because the device driver has to directly talk to the hardware. It could be storage, the CPU, the memory. And if an application that runs in user mode space wants to talk to it, well, it makes a call to the kernel mode process that then goes and talks to the hardware. Now these user mode applications, they can't see the direct memory, for example. They have a very limited view of memory. They see this virtual memory address space, which is private for them. They can't interfere with the memory of another application that only has limited access to what they can do to other processes, etc. And now think of the, the CrowdStrike, which has a number of purposes, but its goal is anti-malware, to protect a system. If I wanna protect something, I need as much visibility as possible on a ship. The lookout was always at the top of the ship so they had a good range of view. But also it needs to be able to access to potentially do protection. If I'm a, a bank and I have my vault, it's no good my security guards being miles away with just a telescope on the front door. That's a limited view. They can't act on it. So they have lots of monitors being able to see everything and they have key cards that can access any of the rooms in case they need to. So because of that, the CrowdStrike engine basically runs in this kernel mode space. So you can think of the engine that runs certain logic. Now there is a testing process, there's a WHQL, a qualification for these. But the way the engine works, if you think about bad things, those bad things, we find out about new bad things, we find out about new behaviors. And so this engine, installs these channel files. Think of the channel file as the logic. It tells it what to look for. And these are updated many, many times a day, which tell it what to do. And so when this is tested, they can't test it every time there's a new channel file. It would take too long. It would delay these being available, so you would lose protection. Well, this channel wasn't telling it to do the thing that caused it to have the bad incident. So the engine runs in the kernel mode so it can see everything. It can see what everything's doing so it can detect if there's problems. So it can protect and perform actions if something's going on. That's the whole point around it. And it actually loads very early in the boot process. So it can see things very early on in that boot process. And fundamentally what happened is it had a bad channel fault because CrowdStrike have said, hey, they had a, a gap in their testing, the testing failed. It got a bad set of logic, which then caused it to do something that caused it to crash. Now, if I'm a user mode application and I crash, the application just crashes because it's potential impact. It can't write memory to another process's memory, for example. It's limited in the damage it can do. If I'm a kernel mode driver and I start writing to memory I shouldn't do, well, there's actually worse things than crashing. The OS does that blue screen 
that process because it's protecting the integrity of the system. If it just said, well, let's see if it will recover and let it do its thing, when it may be writing to the memory or CPU areas of other processes, which then would cause corruption. I would lose the integrity of my system. So it bug checks to say, hey, I can't guarantee my integrity anymore. I'm gonna blue screen to protect the integrity of the overall system. So that's why it blue screen. I remember in the past, there was a GPU driver that had a problem and it would cause the machine to crash for similar reasons. And there's been, everyone becomes an expert in everything uh, on the internet. It's like, well, why does it run as a kernel? Well, again, it wants to be able to see all these different things. And I think there was an EU requirement that Microsoft had to give third parties the same access it had so it was a, a fair playing field for the competition. So that's why they can go and create these kernel mode drivers and that it's not blocked by Microsoft. Now, the next thing that kind of gets thought about is, well, why didn't the customer use rings? And CrowdStrike does enable you to do like an N, the current version, N minus one, N minus two for the Falcon sensor, the engine, but not for these channel file updates that ship multiple times a day. You have no control as the customer, they just push those out. Now, obviously they have acknowledged that it was a failure in the testing to detect the corrupt channel file. And they've acknowledged, hey, really there should be some, I think, staging for the channel file. So they've committed to do things. Microsoft have committed to work with the partners to see maybe what could be improved in the future around those different things. Um, so, I mean, collectively, the goal is to make it more resilient, but that's why customers couldn't protect themselves because they had no control over those channel files. So even if I was running an N-1 or an N-2 engine, uh, that bad channel file would still cause the problem. So that, that's where it is. Um, and remember that that blue screen is not, oh, it's fallen and it can't get up. It's protecting the integrity because something with kernel mode access is doing something it shouldn't be and it, it wants to protect the system. So that was John's take because people have been asking. So elephant in the room with a whiteboard. Uh, thank you, uh, Copilot. Okay, so on to what's actually new. So the app service environments, remember app service environments gives me my own dedicated set of services to host app services. So instead of having a number of shared components, maybe those web front ends and some of the other components, it's all dedicated to me. So the ACE V1 and V2 are being retired end of August, 2024. So you wanna to move to the ACE V3, which is better anyway. They optimize the pricing. Obviously it can integrate with your virtual network. There were a whole set of improvements about uh, the data plane, the control plane, what uh, actions and access it requires. So go and move on to the ACE V3. They also announced the D and the E V6 series virtual machines. So these are the Intel based ones. So the D is the more general purpose and there's different versions of these. There's ones with and without temp storage. Uh, there's ones with different amounts of memory. So the D is the general purpose. The E is the memory optimized. So there's more memory per virtual core. They're based on the Emerald Rapids processor and I think it's 27% higher virtual CPU performance compared to the V5. It's got three times the L3 cache. It uses Azure Boost, so I get these massive amounts of storage and network throughput. So those are in preview. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files has some large volume changes in preview. So firstly now, for my large volumes, I can now go up to one pebibyte, of storage, but additionally, they have a new large volume type that ranges between one and two uh, pebibytes. And I think it's 12 and a half gigabytes per second of performance for every tebibyte uh, of storage you have allocated. So it's literally gonna improve the more storage I have, uh, the higher the throughput performance I have. And also now I can convert to the premium SSD V2s from the standard SSD, the standard hard disk drive, and the premium SSD V1. Remember the big deal with the premium SSD V2 is I can separately pick the IOPS and the throughput. I can dynamically change those values just like I can with the ultra disk, and it has a very, very low latency. So there's a 
lot of benefit in going to the SSD V2. On the database side, so AZAC Snap 10 is now generally available. So this is the Azure Application Consistent Snapshot tool. And it's geared towards when you're running a third-party database on both Windows and Linux. So I can download this tool for Windows and Linux. And what it's gonna do is it handles the orchestration with that third-party database to put it in an application consistent state, then call the snapshot capability of the backend storage. This could be Azure NetApp files, or it can be Azure Large instances if I'm using bare metal. So it will use the snapshot of that backend storage. And then once the snapshot is taken, it will then return the database to its regular operational state. So it lets me get those app consistent snapshots for third party database uh, on Windows and Linux. And then for Azure Monitor Logs, there's actually two changes. So remember we have these different tiers. <laughs> so we had the analytics logs. That was the original type. I think I could have up to two years retention. I had as many queries I wanted included as part of the ingestion price. And I could do cross table at the full KQL set of capabilities. There was also archive. Archive is, I can't actually run queries against it, but I could keep it up to 12 years, but I could either run a restore or a search against it to bring the results into an analytical table to then do analysis against them. Well, then they introduced basic logs. So basic logs were a lot cheaper I could only run single table queries with a subset of the KQL. They would store for eight days. And then if I wanted it for longer, it would go to archive. What they've now done is for basic logs, it now stores for 30 days, just as part of what it is. And then beyond that, it would go to archive. But it also now allowed you to run the full set of KQL on the single table. And I can also go and do lookup against tables in analytical logs. So it's really improving uh, the KQL capabilities against that. And they've also introduced a new type of log. So now we have auxiliary logs. This is geared towards, imagine I have very verbose logs, so huge amounts of data, which means I, I would pay as it's ingested into Azure Monitor logs. So this is way, way cheaper. And what it's gonna give me now is much cheaper ingestion and storage but I can't just run regular queries against it. The goal of what I would do with this is I would run a summary rule against those verbose logs that I bring into the auxiliary logs. And then the results of that summary rule, I would go and store in the analytical logs to then run my regular queries against it. And it says it's gonna store it for 30 days. And then again, you could put it into archive if you wanted. Um, but the goal is, hey, I'll bring in that really verbose stuff. I don't wanna pour, put it directly in analytical because it will cost me a lot of money. So I'll read it into here. I'll run the summary rules, the summaries I can put in my analytical logs to then run my KQL against it. And miscellaneous. So if Azure Site Recovery, if I'm using the modernized experience and the modernized protection, what I get is a virtual appliance. So I get this ASR replication appliance that contains all the different components, the proxy server, the process server that handles collecting the logs and encrypting them and compressing them and sending them off. Uh, there's other services providers and things within there. So it's this all-in-one appliance that I just download as, when I go into VMware, an OVF template, or I can create it with PowerShell. So what I can now do is actually delete and reset. So if all of the different components in the appliance are healthy and I can still access the appliance, I can do a reset. So a reset would put it back to its factory default state and then I could reassociate it with a recovery services vault. If all the components are in a critical state, there's no connectivity, I can now delete it from the Azure portal. Now there's a few infrastructure things I need to go and clean up and delete to make sure it's gonna be successful on the, the Azure side when I do that, but it would now let me go and delete it, it would remove the replication, it would remove the registration as part of my configuration. So that is now available in GA. And that was it, a pretty quick update. Uh, I hope uh, everyone's week wasn't too terrible. Again, we all, we all learn lessons. Uh, until next week, be useful. Uh, have a good one.